I can do this in tongues, English might be a challenge. We are continuing the discussion, well it's not really a discussion because I'm talking with you, but we're on, on the apostolic and the pastoral churches. I probably won't have a lot of friends, the past, I'm finished, but we're, this is what we're looking at because we need to change. When you look at the number of churches uh, on the Gold Coast, the number of churches around the nation, and we're not seeing transformed communities. We're seeing some, some good charities happen. We're seeing homeless being, you know, fed, and we're seeing things happen, but we're not seeing transformation as in heaven coming to earth. We're not seeing colonies of heaven established upon the earth. And that's what this is all about, establishing a colony of heaven upon the earth. That's Matthew 6.10. You know, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I want to live a heaven, days of heaven on earth. I want to live in a colony of heaven upon the earth. And this is what Jesus is saying. So I'm expecting you as you disciple the nations. I am expecting you to bring heaven to earth. So the challenge with the um, pastoral church and the apostolic center and, and Open Heaven Ministries is now Open Heaven Ministries Acts. Apostolic Centre and Training School. Um, that is, we've got that now. It's our registered name. So, um, but part of that is the difference is a pastoral or, or a, a pastoral church is based about one thing or three things. You are you are looking at first of all, you serve the church. You serve the church's vision. You are concerned about the meetings. And it's all about come to the church. If you want to get somebody saved, bring them to the church. If you want to get ministry, come to the church. If you want to see something, come to the church. So it's all come, which is the very opposite of what Jesus said when he said go. So an apostolic center is one that recognizes that you don't serve the church. Because you can't serve yourself. And that's what the church is, you. Thank you, Danny. You cannot serve yourself. You are the ecclesia. You are the governing body of Christ upon the earth. You are the one that says, this is what we will allow, and this is what we will not allow. Because he's given you the keys to bind and to loose. This is the governing part. This is the ecclesia. So the church sounds like a come to meet within the four walls, you know, um, fulfill the vision of the church, serve the pastor, get on the ush of the roster, you know, all that kind of stuff. But Jesus said, I've come here to build the ecclesia. I've come here to release the governing body of Christ upon the earth. I've come here to bring the government of heaven down to earth. That's what we're here for. This is what he did. So we step into that, and that's apostolic. So for the first eight years of the New Testament church, everything was apostolic. It was only apostles. And you know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28 says that first there are apostles, then prophets. So for the first eight years, everything was apostolic. And then the prophets started to come and the teachers started to come, but they came with an apostolic bent. They came as an apostolic prophet, an apostolic teacher. And what that means is they understood when Jesus said, I want you to disciple the nations and I want you to go. And the thing is, you don't need to bring people to me. No, let me get this right. I want you to bring people to open heaven, okay? We want to see this place full. We want to see people saved. I really want people saved, born again, spirit-filled, so we can chuck them out to do the work of the ministry. Now we can get them out there and doing it. So we want people to come. But it's about you. You are the carrier of the kingdom of God. Everywhere you go, you carry that kingdom on the inside of you. So wherever you go, you can lay hands on the sick. You can deliver somebody. You can consecrate um, babies over a shop counter. Hey, Elizabeth. Elizabeth has done that. Consecrated a baby to the Lord over a shop counter. You know, you can do what? Because you actually are the church on wheels. You're the mobile church. We come together to get, um, to, we come together to sharpen each other's gifts, right? We come together to sharpen each other's gifts so that we can go out and impact our communities and change nations and disciple nations. So one of the things is, when you, if you go to a regular church, and I'm not putting them down because there is a place for the house, 
But you serve the pastor's vision or you serve the church's vision. And when people ask you, but what is your vision? What is your destiny? We struggle to find an answer. Anyone recognize that? And if you feel a call of God on your life, you sort of tend to think, well, the only thing I can do is be a pastor. Or be on staff in a church. And God's called you to go out. God's called you to go out. He's called you into business, government. He's called you into hospitals. He's called you into education. He's called you into arts and entertainment. He's called you into communications and media. He's called you to go out. So we come together to sharpen our gifts. We come together to, to um, be built up, edified. But then you've got to go out. So the fivefold ministry is only, it's for three things. If you want to turn to Ephesians chapter 4. It is for three things. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Jesus himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Now we talked last week that the number of times the word pastor turns up in the New Testament is maybe three. Bishop, overseer, some shepherds that look after sheep. But the actual word pastor is maybe two or three times in the whole New Testament. Apostles and prophets are close to 100. I think prophets are over 100. Apostles are about 80. Um, teachers are more, evangelist is, is a small number as well. But remember, that's what we said. So the evangelist only cares about getting somebody saved, right? They get them saved, really don't care about getting them discipled, really don't care about training them up in the things of God. We just want to get them saved, and then who's the next one we can get saved? And that's when the pastor comes along and says, okay, you just got saved, let me show you what it means to, how, this is how you pray, this is how, how you, you, you now cope with a new life. They disciple them things of God. Then the prophet comes in and says, okay, you've been born again a short time now. Let me tell you, God's got a call on your life and he has called you too. So the prophet comes with a specific word of direction and guidance, which has to register with the gift that God's already placed on the inside of you. Then the teacher comes alongside and says, the, the prophet's just given you a word. Well, there are certain things in the word of God that you need to know. So let me devise for you a specific study from the Word of God on the call of God on your life. Then after that, so you, you get the principles of that, you're flowing in that, then the, the Apostle comes alongside, you walk with the Apostle for three months or so, and they say, yes, you can be released into your call, or you just might need to go back and just learn some more things in, in the teaching side of it. But can you see how the fivefold moves together? So wouldn't it have been awesome when we got born again? If I actually was discipled in the things of God. And then a prophet actually came along and said, Suzette, you know what? God's put this in your life. This is the purpose of God for you. And you go, oh, well now it makes sense. I can see, I can see it in my past. I hear it. It registers. And then the teacher sits down and says, you know what? You don't need to know the whole smorgasbord. You just need to know what is important for you and your call. Let's be laser focused and effective. And then the apostle comes along, dabs me with oil and sends me out. Wouldn't that have been awesome? Would have saved a lot of wasted time and a lot of wasted effort. And we actually might have felt we've done something for the kingdom of God instead of just being on duty at the church. So, oh, <laughs> I'm sort of thinking of the reaction of some pastors. <laughs> but, so, we are called together. So in Ephesians chapter 4, there are three reasons why we've got the fivefold. The first one is for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. The second one is for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come to the unity of the faith. For the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Those are the three reasons. For the equipping of the saints. That is your purpose. 
equipping you for your purpose. Why would we equip you for anything that is not your purpose or your destiny? So we need to equip you. It's for the work of the ministry. That means that the ministry that God has called you to, your ministry might be a teacher. Your ministry might be a business person. Your ministry might be a doctor or a nurse. Your minister, your ministry might be an author. But you have a ministry that you work unto the Lord Jesus Christ and you serve Him. And we have got to equip you for the work of your ministry. And then for the edifying, building up. The promoting of, of you, you know, building you up, promoting you, charging you. So there are the three things that we're called to be so that we come to the unity of the faith, so that we come to a perfect man, so that we come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We come to this place. So it's really important that we understand that God's hand is upon your life for your destiny because it's for your purpose. So that the thing that we've not really understood I've only got red or green, so I think red would probably be better. Is that the purpose comes before the person. Purpose always precedes the person. Always. And we see that in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 28, where the Lord blesses them. And he said, I want you to be fruitful, to multiply, to replenish the earth, to subdue it, to have dominion. That was the purpose of man. That is still your purpose. And then in Genesis 2, he then created man. So God had a purpose and a plan before he made the man. So you were born for such a time as this, like Esther. You were born for such a time as this. You, God did not make you and then decide this is your purpose. God said, I need a purpose. I know what's going to be going on in the world at this time. I know what I need people to do in the arts and entertainment. I know what I need people to do in, in business or school or education or whatever. He said, this is my purpose and now I'm going to craft the person. Are you with me on this? Does this make sense? You can see it in the Word. So we've been looking, God, I've got to find my purpose. I've got to find my purpose. But God says it's on the inside. When I created you, I formed you around your purpose. So when it says be fruitful, fruit can only come from a seed. So the seed of your purpose is in you. Like we receive the seed of the Word of God. That we might bring full fruit, 30, 60, 100 fold. So you, when He created you, He placed within you seed for your destiny and purpose. Because you're made of the ground anyway, right? And that's what He did with the earth. He planted the, the seed was within the earth to bring forth grass and fruit and herbs and everything else. So what we've got to recognize is that it is within us because God created the purpose and then he said, I need a specific person for my purpose. And he crafted you. That makes us very special and very unique. And that's why when we pray, particularly in the courts of heaven, when we come before God, we come based on purpose. God, based on the purpose that you have for my life. I ask you to guide me into what I need to know. I ask you to connect me with the right people. I ask for resources to be released. I, because of the purpose that you've placed within me, because of the destiny that you put within me, I ask you to unfold that out. Because it's within you. Is everyone okay with this? So we don't need to go looking out there anywhere. We just need to say, no, it's already in. So what do you enjoy doing? What do you enjoy? What pushes your buttons? What do you really enjoy doing? Because that's a key. That's a key. What makes you happy is a key. Let me tell you another key. What makes you really angry is a key that God has designed you to bring a solution to that. But it's within you. Because 
fruit. He says, be fruitful and multiply. And he's not just talking about having children. He is talking about be fruitful, multiply. He said, I'm wanting you to, to not just bring forth the seed, the, the seed, I want you to bring forth the fruit, but then that fruit's got to multiply. So if I have an apple in my hand, that is fruit. But how much apples are in the apple if you look at the seed? Like it multiplies, doesn't it? So, and this is what God is saying. I'm giving you something that has worked around the purpose that I've created you for. Not only do I want you to bring forth the fruit, I want you to be productive. I want you to work with the purpose. I want you to bring forth and mature the gifts and the, and the skills that I've placed within you. But I want you now to multiply that out. I want you to spread it. So if you're in business, you don't think, and you're a local business, you need to start thinking a little bit bigger. You need to think a little bit, well, maybe I need to go statewide. Maybe I need to go up to the next town. You know, we need to start thinking about these things. So I've never really worried about writing books or having CDs because, hey, it's just me and, you know, I've never really worried. But then I've realised I am breaking the second law that God said. Multiply. And so when I go places, I've got nothing to leave the people. I'm not multiplying. So we've got to learn to multiply. How can you multiply what God's given you? You, you might be an encourager. How awesome to multiply that. Start blogging, start doing something that would bring multiplication of encouragement to people. And then he says that you will replenish. So if you want to turn to Genesis 128, because it's all about the purpose. But there are four rules. So the purpose and the person is worked around the purpose. And then he says, be fruitful. Multiply. I hope this is white book, Marker. <laughs> multiply. Um, be fruitful, multiply. What is it? Um, replenish or fill the earth? Subdue. And number five, when you do these, then you can walk in dominion. But dominion doesn't come until you've done these four. Does that make sense? I should do PowerPoint things. You can see how technical I am, PowerPoint things. But this is straight out of Genesis 1, 28. So it's the power of the blessing. All you need is the blessing of God upon your life to do what God's called you to do. So we're told, you know, you need seven steps to this, you need six steps to this, you need five steps to understand that. Listen, you've got the blessing. And God said to Adam and Eve, do all you need to do to be fruitful, to multiply, to replenish, to subdue, and to have dominion is the blessing. So you've got to understand that you've got to wrap the blessing around your life. You've got to walk in the blessing. You've got to think blessing. That everything you do is blessed. That everywhere you go, you're blessed. That everything you put your hand to is blessed. And so when people tell you, oh, you know what, God's going to teach you a lesson by stripping you of business, that is not the kingdom. Because you're blessed. And it's the blessing of the Lord that makes rich and He adds no sorrow to it. So we have a lot of, we have a lot of Christian phrases that really don't line up with the Word of God. So any time that I've lost anything, any time that money's been stripped away from me, any time, it's because I've done something. It hasn't been because God is trying to teach me. He teaches me through the Word. He teaches me through the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth. He teaches me. But I have consequences. Every choice I make has a consequence, good or bad, it has a consequence. Is this making sense? So, you know, we say things like, oh, well, you know, God had to strip me of everything so I could learn to be really on fire with Him. And then He's got to build it back into us. Hey, if somebody is a non-believer and they hear that, why would they want to be a Christian? You know, like, I don't know. I, don't, I remember years ago when I was teaching a, oh, what was I teaching? It was a, a new believers class. And I asked one of the new believers to close in prayer because I love shoving them out there. And he said, Something along the lines of, God, I know you're into populating heaven, so I don't know how long I've got. 
So I just ask that you juice that I'll, I'll be, you know, useful. And I'm thinking, he's just prayed this out loud in front of the whole class. So how do I change this without making him feel lousy? But my gosh, I can't allow this flippant lie to go out to people. God is into populating earth with heaven. He says he takes no pleasure in the death of his saints. He takes no pleasure in the death of his saints. He is into bringing heaven to earth. He is, you know, like, so I had to sort of say to this guy, well, that's an interesting concept, but it doesn't exactly line up with the heart of God and the truth of God. So the purpose for you was formed in God's mind before you were formed in your mother's womb. The purpose comes before the person. So in Genesis 1.28, there's the purpose of God. But it's in Genesis chapter 2 that Adam and Eve were, were made, right? So if you want to turn to Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah. I'm wondering, you know, um, if I can actually call him Jerry in heaven. I wonder if he's a Jerry person or a Jeremiah. <laughs> so in, in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 it says before before I formed you in the womb I knew you so God had a relationship with Jeremiah in the spirit realm before he was formed in the womb before you were born I sanctified you and I ordained you a prophet to the nations so God had a purpose that he had. He, he needed a prophet at this particular point of time to go to the nations. And he needed a specific personality, a specific gifting of skills and talents and, and, and capacities and capabilities to fill the purpose. And so this is the purpose. I need a prophet to go to the nations because they still need to decree that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is coming. I need a prophet to go to the nations to decree, thus says the Lord. But in this time in the world, the prophets will face persecution and they will face this and they will face that. And so I need a certain type of an individual. And so he crafted Jeremiah. So he took just as much care with you. You were specifically crafted and formed for the purpose he has in mind before you came into your mother's womb. So, you know, like, that to me is amazing. That to me is absolutely amazing that he crafted each and every one of us, formed us in the spirit realm for a purpose before we were formed in the flesh. Does that make you kind of feel? Yeah, pretty good, hey? And so it's really important, not that the church fulfills its vision, because that's not God's purpose. God's purpose is that you fulfill your purpose. That's the heart of God. And that's why the apostolic centers are different because it's not about the vision of the church it's not about the vision of you know open heaven it's not about that if that's why open heaven is open heaven ministries plural it is about the ministry of every person in this ecclesia because god has got a purpose and a plan for you there is a timing there is a perfect time there are specific relationships specific connections there are specific resources and he has called you and placed you around his purpose and that is what he, he is calling you to. That's why in the, in the pastoral churches we sit. We sit. And we wait. And, and sometimes, you know, praise God, we're allowed to do communion. Sometimes we're allowed to do something. Sometimes, you know, we're on the ushering thing. Like, woo -hoo! Or, you know, but it's not about us sitting down waiting. The thing is, God has a plan for you and he expects you to be up and going after his purpose and his plan for your life. Jeremiah 29, 11. You know, I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans of good um, and, and not of evil to give you a hope and a, and a future, an expected outcome. He's got plans. Yeah. 
Yeah. Not plans for the church, yeah. but plans for the people. We need to change some mindsets. Change your mindsets. So we come together and we figure out what is God doing in your life? That's what we should be talking about around the tables. What is God doing in your life? What should you, do you really understand your purpose and your plan? Do you know where God's taking you? Because hey, if not, I'll pray for you and you can pray for me. You know what I mean? Let's, let's start coming alongside each other and saying, what's your purpose? You know, oh man, I've got the same kind of thing. Maybe we could knit together and we could work together and double out, you know? We've got to understand that you're here for a reason and the reason is His purpose. So there will be times when I step back into church mode. I am human. So when I do, my beautiful daughter pulls me up <laughs> I go home and she says, do you realise how religious you were? <laughs> but I love it. She keeps me grounded. But we've got to start doing that. When we, we talk to each other and you start to hear a bit of church culture coming out, not kingdom talk, church culture. Say, so, hey, you know what? Do you really believe that? Let's, let's move into the freedom of the kingdom. Let's just gently minister to one another because we want kingdom I want the kingdom of God in this nation I want this nation as a sheep nation I want the families that are falling apart because of financial pressure and gender vendors and everything else I want them to know the truth and to know the power and the strength of the love of God I want the children growing up in a safe environment I don't want to see kids with drugs on the street corners I don't want to see the homeless in this nation I don't want to see people struggling and, and you know, like my father had one light on in the house at a time because of the electricity bill and he was on a fixed income. So it was only one light on and when he left that room to go to the toilet or whatever, that light went off. People should not be living like that when there is an abundance. And they need to know that God is a God of abundance. And so whatever purpose he's placed in your heart and in your life, he is expecting you to rise up and to fulfill it. Because I know when I stand before him at the end of my days, he's going to say, Suze, this was the purpose that I had for your life. How'd you go? And I'm, I'm yeah, exactly right. Oops. Because <laughs> for a lot of us, we're not even aware that he has a purpose. We just get up and go to work and come home and, and we just live and we go to church. And we're not even really aware, apart from going to church and being involved in that, that God has a purpose and a plan. But He does. And so we're going to have to stand before Him and give an account. So when you pray, you pray based on your purpose. God, I want to know your will because I want to fulfill your purpose. God, I need to be free of debt because I need the resources to fund the purpose you've placed in my life. God, I need to be successful in business because it's the only way that your purpose can be outworked and I can reach the people you want me to reach. Now, we've got to start thinking differently because you were formed for a purpose. The purpose came before the person. Awesome, I find it delightful and scary. And it's sort of like, God, I'm, I'm, I'm 66. And I'm only just starting to realize that my purpose was not to go to church. That my purpose was not to just attend church and just be a good Christian and live in a good way. But you actually, you actually did have a specific plan and purpose for my life. So can we just sort of like redeem the time? Can we sort of catch up on the bits that I've missed out on? Can we sort of do something here, Lord? Because I really can't claim ignorance. Because he's going to say to me, but you had the word and you have the Holy Spirit. You can't claim ignorance, you said. Because I, I, I'd like to claim ignorance. But when we've got the Holy Spirit and you've got the word, there is no ignorance. Because he's the spirit of truth. 
So he's got this amazing purpose. And he, he needs your purpose outworked and done in this season. And when he thought about your purpose, he thought about what kind of a person he would need. What about the gifts and the skills and the talents? About what would make you happy? About what would what would you know tick, tick you off? He thought about everything so that his purpose would be outworked in a perfectly mature and awesome way. So you're not just a random number of chromosomes and cells thrown together. You are specifically formed by God to fulfill a divine purpose. And it's time. Our nation needs God's purposes completed. So in your purpose, we always go back to Genesis 1.28. I have got to be fruitful, which means I've got to find that seed of purpose on the inside. And for some of us, it still might be a seed. For some of us, it might be starting to grow. For some of us, we might have overlooked it. We might, I'm surely not that surely if that's not what God wants me to do. But it's there. So we've got to spend a bit of time and say, God, I want to bring forth the seed of purpose in my life. So anything that blocks it, anything that gets in the way, any mindset, uh, any, any habits I might have, any perspectives that I've got, God, if it's blocking uh, the perspective of, your, of the seed of your purpose in my life, I ask that any obstacle would be removed. I call forth the seed of purpose in my life to come forth. I call it to come forth and to arise. I command it to grow and to be fruitful. And then as it starts to grow and as it's fruitful, then you say, okay, God, I need now to know how to multiply this in the name of Jesus. How do I multiply the fruit so that my gift expands and explodes and goes forth and carries around and we subdue the earth because when you replenish and when you subdue that's when you start to walk in dominion it comes through recognizing your purpose getting it fruitful multiplying it and then releasing it going it out subduing replenishing you are so needed in this nation now I love the fact that you come to open heaven acts I love that but you need it in the nation There are people in the nation that need you. Maybe there are other nations that need you. But your purpose is out there. He said, go and make disciples of all nations. That was not to the fivefold ministry. That was not to the pastor. That was to every believer. Go and make disciples of the nations. That was not a ministry call if you're thinking fivefold layman, because the pastoral church is pastor layman. This is to all believers, because every believer is a full time minister of the gospel, and you are called to be an ambassador for Christ. And so he's called you. And that's why in Deuteronomy chapter 8, I love this. You, if you bring everything back to these four things and to Jesus Christ, you will see awesome stuff. You bring everything back to these four things, the four mandates that God gave to people in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, and then Jesus Christ, you fulfilled everything. So let me tell you, where did I say to go? Deuteronomy. We'll go there and then we'll go to 1 John. So Deuteronomy chapter 8. It says in verse 11, 13, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 13. Listen to this. And when your herds and your flocks multiply, when, not if, not maybe, but when your herds and your flocks multiply. So that's your businesses and your ministries. Herds of business, flocks of ministry. Because we've got a different society now, we're not agricultural. So when your businesses multiply, when your ministries multiply, when your silver and gold and your financial affairs multiply, when all that you have is multiplied, it's an expectation. 
that everything you have would multiply. It's an expectation that your business will multiply. It's an expectation that your ministry will multiply. It's an expectation that your finances will multiply. And I'm telling you right now that half the time the body of Christ doesn't expect multiplication. But this is what the Word of God says. When it multiplies. When it multiplies. And that's the second, that's, that's the part of the mandate that we have in Genesis 1.28. Because that mandate's never changed. It never changed. It's still there. I want you to be fruitful, to multiply, to replenish, to subdue and have dominion. So when Adam and Eve sinned, and then God re-established the covenant with Noah, it was be fruitful, multiply, replenish, subdue. But the one thing that Noah was not given was dominion. Because Satan had it. But we've got dominion because of Jesus. Because of Jesus. Because of what he did at the cross. Dominion and authority was given back to the body of Christ. And we can walk in that. So we've got everything back. Better than what it was when Adam and Eve walked the earth. Better. So we've got to start thinking Garden of Eden. We've got to start thinking Garden of Eden. What would it be like to have a life of, a life of delight? Because that's what Eden meant. So we've got to start getting a little bit militant on the inside and recognize some stuff that crops up in our lives is not of the kingdom of God, it's of the kingdom of darkness, or it's a consequence of a bad choice. So we rebuke that in the name of Jesus. I command a crop failure on that in Jesus' name. That is not going to multiply in my life. Fruit will not come forth in my life. That's going to stop in Jesus' name. You're going to get a bit militant. Yes, amen. Because you've got to fulfill your purpose. And expect multiplication. Amen. Expect to be debt free. Yes. And, and even if you know you're working for somebody or, or you're on a pension or whatever it might be, that's just a source, but it's not the source. It is a source. He is the source. And you are not limited to what comes in your pay packet. You are not limited to your pension. You're not limited to your superannuation. You're not limited. supposed to multiply. So we've got to change our mindset. Yeah. Do you really expect multiplication? Yeah. Yeah. I do. Yes. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> so we've got to change, guys. Hey? So the purpose is what it's all about. First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3. And if it's like this for Jesus, then it's like this for us. First John chapter 3, the last part of verse 8. For, well, we'll start with the, we'll read the whole verse. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned for the begin, from the beginning. But look at this. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. This is the purpose that Jesus came to earth. He came for a purpose to destroy the works of the devil. So for this purpose, not for a purpose, not for all purpose, but for this particular purpose, Jesus came to the earth to destroy the works of the devil. So you have a particular purpose. For this purpose, Janice, for this purpose, you came to the earth. For one particular purpose. For the purpose. So if that's what it was for Jesus, how much more for us? Yeah? For this purpose, you were born. For this purpose. Remember Esther, for such a, for such a time as this. The purpose, Esther. It's not about you, Esther. It's not about your life, Esther. It's about the purpose. Because of you, Esther, maybe we can save the nation. The purpose of God was to save the nation. And he used a woman named Esther because he crafted what he wanted for that purpose in that person. So it comes back to the purpose. If you want to know what God made you, if you want your life to turn around, you start praying, God, bring forth my purpose with a clarity and an understanding. 
so that I can bring forth the fruit so it can multiply, so it can replenish the earth, so it can subdue, so I can walk in dominion. When it says replenish, it means that that is to replace what the devil has done. Right? My gift, when it comes forth and it multiplies, replenishes what was lost in the Garden of Eden. It subdues the work of the enemy. And I walk in dominion. Can you see how important this is? You replace and replenish. You fill the earth with the fruits of righteousness. You fill the earth with the fruits of righteousness. When we all start walking in our purpose, you fill the earth with fruits of righteousness. That's filling. And that's subduing the works of the enemy. And then the dominion happens. So if you want to turn to 1 Samuel 17, we'll finish with this. I think we'll finish with this, you know what I'm like. Are you enjoying this today? So we're going to continue this next week. 1 Samuel 17. Now this is David. And David had already been anointed as king. So whether you recognize it or not, you have already been anointed for your purpose. You have been equipped for it. You've been um, sanctified for it. You have been separated to your purpose, which means you have been separated from the things that are not your purpose. That's what God intended, Jeremiah 1.5. I've sanctified you. I've separated you to your purpose. I've separated you from the things of the world and I've separated you to your purpose. And I have equipped you and I have ordained you and I have crafted you to bring forth the purpose of God. And so we see here in 1 Samuel chapter 17, what I say here, 1 Samuel 17, David had already been anointed king. That was his purpose. He had not yet stepped into it. It had not yet become a reality. He'd just been anointed with oil. He just knew it had been confirmed. Probably he had an understanding of it as he's out there looking after the sheep and killing the bear and the lion and everything else, but he knew. And so what's his name? Samuel comes along and anoints him and he recognizes, I have a purpose and it is to be a king. But he is not, nothing changed. His circumstances haven't changed, nothing's changed. But he's changed because he's found his purpose. So you have been anointed in the realm of the Spirit for your purpose. The Holy Spirit has already anointed you and God formed you. There was, a, there was a consecration, there was a sanctification, there was a separation for you. An anointing was placed within you for your gifting, for your call, for your purpose. And so Samuel is sent down by his dad to check on his brothers because they've got this kerfuffle happening with Goliath. Just a normal kind of a thing, just something obedient to his dad, but he goes. But he knows his purpose. And so, you know, and then his brother has a go at him. What are you doing here? Come, what, left your few sheep and come here. His brother has a go. And then David says, thinking of blessing. Well, what does the guy get if he knocks off Goliath? Like, you know, what... What's in it for me? And I'll be tax free and you get the king's daughter and a few other things thrown in, you know, so I'm okay, looking pretty good. But then he's, the Goliath comes out and Goliath rules. And David sees the effect that that has on the nation. The soldiers run away in fear. Saul stays in his tent. And so David with the anointing of the king and the recognition of purpose, steps into a kingly purpose and defeats the enemy of the nation. He knew his fruit. This was part of the multiplication. This was part of defeating the enemy and releasing things. But this is when he recognized his purpose. He didn't have to sit on the throne, but he knew what God had called him to. And he recognized that the king of Israel at that time, Saul was not doing what needed to be done as a king. And there was 
a way that he could step into it and he stepped into that purpose. And so you are going to find opportunities that will crop up in front of you that you're going to think, you know what? I know God's called me to this. And the anointing's going to stir. And you're going to find yourself by faith stepping into a situation and a circumstance and releasing the purpose of God, which is training for when you step into the fullness of the purpose. This was training for David, like the cave of Adullam was training, like being on the run from King Saul was training until he actually stepped into it. So you've got to recognize that some of the things you step into are not, not demonic as such, or it could be demonic, but it's, it's more along the lines of, you know what, God is wanting to hone your purpose. He's wanting to clarify your purpose. He's wanting you to step into your purpose, to call up that anointing, to understand what he's made you for and birthed you for, so that you can step into it for the first little bit, ankle deep. Knee deep, hip deep, and then you're fully in the purpose and fully in the anointing and bringing about what God's called you to do. This is what David did. This is what you're called to do. For some of you that make money and it's really easy to make money, guess what? That's your purpose. And there is nothing wrong with making heaps of money if it's for the kingdom. For those of you who love teaching or love being with children, if that is your purpose, pursue it, skill it, upgrade yourself in it, whatever it might be, but you've got to upskill. You've got to upskill. This is what the people in the world get that we don't. We think, oh, well, I've got God, I've got the anointing, I've got the Holy Ghost, it'll be right, the favour of God's all over me, and we step into situations thinking that that's going to crack it. But the thing is that the people in the world have gone to the, they've done courses, they've skilled themselves, they understand what's happening in the, in the industry, and so they're a bit ahead in the natural. So we've got to do both. We've got to upskill in the natural and hone ourselves in the spiritual so that when it's time to step into the purpose, you step in and every, all guns are firing. Spiritual and natural, mentally, emotionally, you step into it. Do you understand what I'm saying? So we've got to start thinking, well, you know what? I do have the favor of God. I do have the anointing of God. I do know the truth of God's word. But Father, if there is something I need to study in the natural, if you want me to go back to university, if you want me to go to tape, if you want me to do something, God, if you want me to study investments, if you want me to study things, God, I'll put my hand up and I'll say, yes, God, I will do anything to fulfill your purpose in my life. Because it's about his purpose. For this purpose, Jesus was manifested. For this purpose, God made Adam to be fruitful, to multiply, to replenish the earth, to subdue and to have dominion. For this purpose. So we've got to understand that we have a purpose. And we can be thinking, man, you know what? I am way too old for this. Left my run a bit late. Sorry, God. I'll just continue bit late. But you know what? Caleb was 80. But he took his mountain. Never too late. Never too old. Because God's purpose is always wanting to be released. And the Holy Spirit is always going to redeem your time. And you can be repositioned. Things can be changed so that you can walk into the purpose of God for your life. It doesn't matter what your circumstances are. You might think it's impossible with the way my life is at the moment. It is impossible. I can't see a way to walk into my purpose. But all you've got to do is come before God and say, you know what, God? I can't see a way, but you are the way maker. I can't see a way, but you make a way where there is no way. I can't see a way. I'm not even quite sure what my purpose is. But God, I come to you and I say, I am willing to fulfill your purpose for my life. And so I stand before you and I say, do whatever is required so that the manifestation of your purpose is worked out in my life and in my time. In Jesus' name. Amen. No excuses. There are no excuses. I would have loved to stood before God and said, yeah, but my ex. Or yeah, but my kids. Or yeah, but my finances. All the buts. You know, yeah, God, but. But there are no excuses when we stand before him. He loves us too much 
to allow us to hide behind anything. But that's not a scary thing. That's a re restoring, redemptive thing with God. So I want to encourage you to find your purpose, to fulfill your purpose, to work out what it is that God's got for you, where he wants to take you, what he wants to do through you and with you and, and for you. There were three things that came against David with Goliath. The sword, the spear and the javelin. So understand that there are some things that will come against you, but in the spiritual realm, it wasn't coming against the man. It was coming against the purpose. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed, God, not my will, but your will be done. Because the crucifixion was aimed at, in the natural, the man had to go through it. But it was to stop the purpose. So there will be some things that come against us. I am not promising an easy ride, but I am promising a victorious one. I am promising that we are more the conquerors, that we will always triumph in Christ, that we overcome. I am promising that God's got his hand upon your life and the favour of God will be there. And as you step into the purpose, things might come against you, but not one weapon formed against you can prosper. And every tongue raised against you in judgment is condemned and shown to be in the wrong. And so in verse 45, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 45, one of the things that came against David was a sword. Do you know what the sword represents for warfare. Sometimes it's a spirit of confusion. Sometimes it's a spirit of um, fogginess. You know what? I don't know what else to call it. But there are times when there are spirits that come against you, right? So recognize what it is. But you've got the sword of the spirit. You've got the Holy Ghost and the sword of the spirit beats the spirit of, of, of the sword of, of the demonic. That's right. Yeah. So come against you. Know, I'm feeling really confused. Well, I buy that confusion in Jesus' name. I feel really hopeless now. Well, I buy that hopelessness in Jesus' name. Because Christ is in me, the hope of glory. So I am full of hope all the time in Jesus' name. So you've got to come back. When you recognize the sword coming at you, come back with the sword of the Spirit. Speak the word of God. Release the power of the word. The next thing that came at him was a spear. And sometimes, you know, that's like a, that's like a betrayal. You know, when, when somebody you love speaks against you, when somebody you love says something, it pierces the heart. It's a spear. Sometimes you can feel a spear in the back, you know, when people just love you from the back. And then there's back, back stabbing. So understand that sometimes we have to go through the, 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 um, the betrayal season, um, you know, like Jesus and, and Judas. There are things like that we will have to go through, but we go through them. We don't stand in them. And we don't allow them to craft who we are. We don't allow them to change us because we're being changed from image to image into the glory of Christ. And so we don't allow the spears or the swords to change us. We change them. We send them back to the owners in Jesus. We send them back. Jesus' name. And the last one was the javelin. That means it's come from afar and it's come with a weight and it's come with a power. But you know what? That can be stopped mid-air and turned back in the name of Jesus. You do not have to receive the spear, the sword or the javelin. You don't have to receive this. You send it back. You recognize your authority. And when you step into your purpose and you're standing for purpose, you will like you come into that secret place. You come into that place where you are protected, where the power of God is all you're standing up for the purpose of God. This is what you get up for in the morning. Not to make, you know, was another day, another dollar, whatever. You don't get up for that. You don't get up because it's Sunday and you have to go to church. You get up for the purpose of God that's in you. You get up because the purpose is just, it is just churning on the inside. The zeal of the Lord of hosts is at work. Crafting that purpose, releasing that purpose, drawing you forth to stand out of the shadows and to come into the light. It's going to position you as the head and not the tail, above and not beneath when you take hold of purpose. One of the reasons we are not the head and we're not above is because we have not released the purpose. And we're trying to be the head in a wrong area. We're trying to be the, the head in a wrong area. <laughs> I can't think of the words, I'll use it twice. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes. 
You are so amazing. You are so amazing. And you were crafted for God's purpose. He's called you to an amazing destiny. And he's get your eyes off the church. Because you are the church. Get your eyes on the me and I'll show you your purpose. And as you step out and as you walk into this, you will grow in the things of God. The anointing will be released. The power of God will flow like you've never seen. Because we've tried to get the power of God. Yeah, yeah, God, God, we just want to see your power. You're probably not going to see the power if it's not about his purpose. Find your purpose. Bring forth the fruit. Ask God how to multiply it. Replenish the earth. Bring forth what should have been there before Adam and Eve. Subdue the enemy and walk in dominion. Because that's who you are. And this is what David did. He had the fruit. He was anointed to be a king. He multiplied that because he stepped up in front of Saul and in front of all the Israeli soldiers and he took on Goliath. So he multiplied it. People saw it. Then he replenished the earth. He got rid of Israel's uh, enemies. They were gone. And then he subdued the enemy totally because they all took off. But then he walked into dominion because he cut off Goliath's head. You have got to cut off the head of the spirit that comes after you. You've got to cut off the head of that thing that plagues your footsteps, whether it's poverty, whether it's hopelessness, whether it's low self-esteem, whether it's anxiety or worry. You have got to cut off its head and say, that's it, you're finished in my life. Once and for all, forever, I am free to pursue the purpose of God, to move in the power of God, to release God's plans upon the earth and to bring heaven to earth. That is the goal. Bring heaven to earth. So we need our own venue so that we can have stuff happening. And we've got it's either a lift or something so people don't have to struggle up the stairs if they're not. <laughs> you know, because we've got people in wheelchairs that want to come and they can't access the room. And it's very easy to say, well, we can just heal them down there, but their faith's got to be activated. They've got to believe when you lay hands on them, they're going to receive it. So we need our own place. I'm calling it in. I've had, I said to the Lord, you're going to have to bring it to me because I'm too busy to go look at it. But bring it to me. And I want it finished, fitted, full, full of people and free. I'll have the four, four. Finished, fitted, full and free. So, but, you know, but this is the purpose. My purpose is to train people, to equip them for victory so that they can fulfill their purpose. That's my purpose. That's the reason for this church, Open Heaven Ministries Acts, is to equip you to get out there and do the purpose that God has laced upon your heart. That's what, that's my purpose. So in order to do that, I need a place where I can train people all the time, 24-7, we can have stuff going, and we can train people, we can say, what's the problem? You're in business, you're in education, you're in this, what's the problem, what's the challenge? Let's get alongside and let's work out your purpose and redefine where what God's called you to clear the path and get you released into it. That's the purpose. So as we step into that, we're going to see, you know, like you, your lives will explode with joy. You will be fulfilled. It's what you were born for, to fulfill the purpose of God. It is not about church, because you are the church. But it's not even church. The word is ecclesia, ecclesia, whichever you want. But it's that which means you are God's governing body upon the earth. And the reason that un one of the reasons that ungodly legislation got in this nation is because we prayed as priests and not as kings. We prayed supplication and not from purpose. We did not pray the purpose of God for this nation. So we need to change. Now I know that there were people that were taking Australia into the courts of heaven. There were people who were decreeing, but we need a few more people released into their purpose. See, you 
are called to be fruitful, which means you've got to know the seed of purpose in your life. Yes. Bring forth the fruit. It just has to be a little bit. First the ear, then the stalk, then the, what's it, first the blade, first the blade, then, the, then it grows. So you know, so that it just, but just step into it. Just step into it. And allow God to do what He wants. Find your purpose. And when it starts to bring forth fruit, and Psalm 1, remember Psalm 1 verse 3? That you planted by the rivers of water, your fruit will not fail, your leaf will not wither, you will bring everything you do will prosper and come to maturity. That's your purpose. And so as you do that, as you bring it forth, wow, multiply it, replenish it so it's a little bit like a colony of heaven on earth, subdue the enemy, cut off its head, and have dominion. This is what God's called you to. This is what God's called you to. So Danny, we might, I'm just going to pray a corporate prayer and then we're going to worship. And then we're going to have Tony lead us in communion. Tithe, whatever you want, Tony. This is just handing you the mic, man. <laughs>